In this video, we're going to discuss and demonstrate the MOPSI protocol, which is an approach to treating patients with pneumonia using osteopathic manipulation. It includes a series of eight techniques that are performed in succession, and the total treatment duration is about 10 to 15 minutes. As I work through this demonstration, I'm going to be touching a few different areas from your head, neck, along your rib cage, along your spine, uh, down to your uh, low back and the front of your abdomen and down to your feet. If you feel uncomfortable, if anything is tender, if you need me to stop or change what I'm doing, please let me know. Is it okay if I begin? Yes. Okay. So the first technique is soft tissue of the thoracic and lumbar spine. We can begin by taking their arm and lifting their arm in front of them so that we can uh, easily slide behind them to find spinous processes. And then at that point, we could either take their arm and rest it across their chest to their other shoulder. Uh, and then they could either leave their arm across their chest or they could put it down to their side. So starting with palpation of the spinous processes, we're then gonna move slightly lateral to find the medial aspect of the paraspinal musculature. And then we're gonna hook our fingers on that medial aspect of the paraspinal musculature and then using our fingertips as well as our wrists and our forearms and dropping our elbows for leverage, we're gonna apply an anterior and lateral traction along the muscles perpendicular to the muscle fibers. And we're gonna repeat that moving inferiorly along the thoracic paraspinal musculature, pressing anteriorly, pulling laterally, holding for a few seconds as we feel a little bit of release, and then repeating that. And we can repeat that rhythmically, moving down the thoracic and lumbar spine. And if we find any particular area that's a little resistant to our initial force, we can add a sustained anterior and lateral traction, or we can add a sustained inhibitory pressure along those muscles until we feel a sufficient release. And then we're gonna continue down the rest of the lumbar spine, and then we'll repeat on the opposite side. Our next technique is rib raising. So we can again start at the superior aspect of the thoracic cage. We're gonna take our patient's arm, lift it up so that we can easily access the posterior aspect of their thoracic cage. And then we can take their hand and bring it over to their opposite shoulder and then slide our other hand in. And then their hand can stay across their chest or it can uh, move down to the side. Now from here, starting from spinous processes, we're gonna move lateral to the paraspinal musculature and then a little more lateral until we find the rib angles. We're gonna hook our fingertips onto the medial aspect of those rib angles. And now using a connected force from our fingertips down through our wrists, through our forearms, down to our elbows, we're gonna push our elbows down and create a fulcrum, create a lever that is gonna add an anterior lateral force onto the rib angles. And we're gonna continue in a rhythmic fashion, applying that force along the ribs, descending down to the inferior ribs. When we find a particular area that's resistant to change, we can add more articulation in that region, or we can add a sustained anterior and lateral pressure until we feel sufficient release. And we're gonna continue to treat all the ribs on this side, and then we're gonna treat on the opposite side as well. Our next technique is indirect myofascial release of the diaphragm. For this variation of the technique, we're gonna take our hand and we're gonna slide it under our patient's thoracolumbar junction to engage with the curl attachments of the diaphragm. And then we're gonna take our anterior hand and we're gonna place it vertically along their abdomen, uh, pressing our fingers into the subxiphoid area where we can find the anterior attachments of the diaphragm. And then from here, we're gonna test motion of the diaphragm in multiple planes. So we can test flexion by moving our anterior hand inferiorly while moving our posterior hand superiorly. We can test extension by moving our anterior hand superiorly while moving our posterior hand inferiorly. We can test rotation to the left by moving our anterior hand to the left and our posterior hand to the right. We can test rotation to the right by moving our anterior hand to the right and posterior hand to the left. We can test side bending in a few different ways. We can start with pure translation by translating both hands to the patient's left, we can induce side bending to the right. And by translating both hands to the right, we can induce side bending to the left. We can also induce side bending by using more of a clockwise and counterclockwise motion. So by moving both hands in a clockwise fashion relative to the physician, we can induce side bending to the left. And moving both hands in a counterclockwise fashion, we can induce side bending to the right. We can also, because of the 
multiple uh, complex attachments of the diaphragm, we can also mobilize our hands in opposite directions, and sometimes we can find that to be helpful. So we're gonna test our motions in all directions, and we find that our patient's diaphragm is extended, rotated to the left, and side bent to the right, and we're gonna stack our motions towards all of the freedoms of motion, and we're gonna hold until we feel sufficient release and unwinding of the myofascial tissues. And then we return our patient back to a neutral position. Our next technique is soft tissue of the cervical spine. We're gonna take our fingertips, we're gonna find the inferior aspect of the cervical spine and find the paraspinal musculature lateral to the spinous processes. We're gonna take our fingers and press anteriorly and then using a cradling motion, we're going to add a longitudinal stretch along those tissues tractioning superiorly and dragging along those tissues. We can move in a rhythmic fashion, or if there's a particular area that is resistant to change, then we can apply a sustained pressure. We're gonna to continue to move superiorly until we reach the suboccipital area. Once we reach the suboccipital area, we'll move on to our next technique, which is suboccipital inhibition. We're gonna take our patient's head and cradle it in our hands. We're gonna take our fingertips and gather all of the suboccipital musculature. And we're gonna find the most significant areas of tension towards the midline and just lateral. And we're gonna bunch those tissues up against the occipital condyles, press anteriorly and slightly laterally if needed, adding an inhibitory pressure. And we're gonna hold that pressure until we feel a sufficient release of the soft tissues. And then we return our patient back to a neutral position and reassess the region. Our next technique is myofascial release of the thoracic inlet. We're gonna take our thumbs, slide them back by T1 and rib one. We're gonna take our index fingers, place them posterior to the clavicles. Our middle and ring fingers and little fingers are gonna be immediately anterior and inferior to the clavicles. And now grasping the thoracic inlet, we're going to test different planes of motion. We're gonna test rotation. We're gonna test side bending via straight translation. And then we're gonna test flexion and extension by dragging the thoracic inlet anteriorly and then posteriorly. For, for my patient, they are side bent to the right, rotated left, and flexed. So utilizing indirect principles, we're gonna hold the thoracic inlet towards all of its freedoms of motion. And then we're gonna maintain that position until we feel sufficient release and then we'll return our patient back to a neutral position and reassess. Our next technique is the thoracic pump. For our female patients, we're gonna have them put their hands on their chest and move their breast tissue downwards. We have two different hand positions that we can use. For our first, we can point our fingers towards the midline, take our thenar eminences and place them immediately under the clavicles and then have our fingers overlap along the midline. Alternatively, we can bring our thenar eminences a little bit closer to the middle of the clavicle and then allow our fingers to move a little bit more inferiorly overlapping over the sternum. And this is the position that I prefer. Also in this position, we're gonna bring our elbows into a relatively locked out position. And we're gonna be applying an inferior and posterior force to emphasize the exhalation phase as our patient is breathing in and out. As they breathe in, we're gonna resist the motion. And as they breathe out, we're gonna add that posterior and inferior force in an oscillatory motion. Take a deep breath in. We're gonna resist that inhalation and then breathe out. And as they breathe out, we're gonna add an oscillatory force until they reach the end of exhalation. Take a deep breath in and then out. And we're gonna emphasize that exhalation. And we can repeat this for a total of three to five times and out. Let's do that one more time. And breathe out. And at the end of this exhalation, we're gonna have our patient take a deep breath in rapidly with their mouth open, go ahead. And then at the end of that inhalation, we're gonna rapidly lift our hands off, which is gonna generate a rapid decrease in intrathoracic pressure and allow for a rapid inhalation and expansion of the lungs. Our next technique is pedal pump. 
For this technique, we're going to have the table a little bit higher. We're also going to be prepared to uh, lower our body position and widen our stance as needed. We're going to want to position ourselves with our elbows resting to their side and flexed to about 90 degrees. We're going to take our hands and we're going to make contact on the inferior aspect of the patient's feet. And we're going to place the middle of our palm, hooking our thenar eminence under their metatarsophalangeal joints. And throughout this technique, we're going to be applying a dorsal flexion and eversion force to generate a fluid wave throughout the body. So first we're gonna send an impulse with a rapid uh, dorsal flexion and eversion, and we're gonna be observing and feeling when that fluid wave gets to the top of the patient's head and then comes back into our hands. And we're gonna to try to match the pace of our oscillations with that fluid wave. So we'll test it one more time, up, down, and then we're gonna to try to match that fluid wave rate so that we can optimize our efficiency of motion and we're gonna observe at the patient's nose to determine whether we're achieving sufficient oscillation. And we don't wanna to use too much force and we don't wanna jerk our patient around too much. And we're gonna maintain this for about one to two minutes. And then we'd return our patient back to a neutral position and then reassess for any presence of lymphatic congestion.